everybody, and welcome to today's webcast. As part of our information governance series, today's program will provide you with the top five security issues for information governance. We're very excited to have all of you on board, and we appreciate you taking your time out of your busy schedules to join us. My name is Anne-Marie Cochia, Director of Marketing here at Canon Business Process Services, and I'll be your moderator for today. Before we get started, I do have a few quick housekeeping notes. We are recording today's session, and we'll have the webcast available on demand for those unable to join us today. To eliminate background noise, all participants have been muted. You will only hear our, our panelists speak. If you'd like to ask us a question, you may do so at any time by clicking the chat button in the WebEx dashboard on the right side of your screen. Type your question, click send, and we will try to address your question before the end of the program. Because we only have a limited time, we do apologize in advance if we are unable to address your question online, but we'll be sure to follow up on any unanswered questions after the program. And let's move on to our agenda. As part of our webcast series on information governance, today we'll be discussing the security issues that impact an effective governance program. First, we will set the stage with the security issues many of us are facing and the elements of a sound information governance framework. Then we will discuss the principles of information governance and security, the five information security issues you should be aware of as you hone your information governance program. Lastly, we will cover the lessons learned and next steps, and we'll have a few minutes at the end for Q&A. Before we get started, and I will be quick on this, for those of you not familiar with Canon Business Process Services, I'd like to give you a little background on who we are. We are a division of Canon USA focused on enabling clients to improve operational and business performance. We have been serving clients for 30 years and offer a wide range of outsourcing solutions from developing and implementing information governance and records management to document management and imaging services. We support the law firms and in-house legal departments with discovery services from consulting to technology to project management. We deliver customized solutions that can be on-site, off-site, or offshore, depending on the client needs and requirements. Lastly, over the past 10 years, we've been recognized as one of the top 100 global outsourcing providers by the International Association of Outsourcing Professionals. Well, let's get started. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to our esteemed panelists for today. Melissa Carlos has over 16 years of experience helping companies develop an information management strategy and program that meets business objectives and minimizes risk. Melissa has written a number of articles and is a frequent speaker at industry events and leads the Information Governance Solutions Group here at Canon. Jonathan Lichman is a co-founder and CEO of the Providence Group based in Washington, D.C. Jonathan is a national security veteran with experience as an intelligence officer at the CIA and Defense Department, a staff member of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, and a senior defense industry P&L executive. Jonathan and Melissa, we're so glad to have you with us today, and we thank you for carving out this time to share your expertise and insights with us. Thank you so much. <clears throat> um, let me start also just by introducing um, to everyone the Providence Group. Uh, the Providence Group advises companies and organizations on how to manage enterprise-wide cybersecurity risks. And we provide insight and counsel into the complex and changing cybersecurity regulatory, reputation, and threat environment. We help companies plan for and manage cyber risks uh, through our services, which include cybersecurity risk audits and gap analysis, risk and threat intelligence, uh, risk framing support, cybersecurity communications council, and we act as trusted advisors um, with third parties. It's often said, uh, and this quote from uh, former FBI Director Robert Mueller, um, that it's not a matter of uh, if you're hacked, but when. And so uh, that's even becoming uh, merged into not when, but when again. 
And so I think that unfortunately sets the stage in terms of the environment that we're all living in uh, in this very complex cybersecurity world. So how does cybersecurity touch on our roles as information governance professionals or records managers? As we've discussed in our series of webinars on information governance, we have explained on numerous occasions that our world has transitioned from the paper, from the records management software, from the document management system into basically encompassing all types of data. Data is the number one business asset for any company, for any firm. And as part of a successful records management program, the governance and the security are concerns that must be addressed hand in hand. And we have to keep in mind that as information governance professionals, we need to empower the business owners, and which are our employees and our colleagues, that when they're working with the data that, own, that is owned by the corporation, that they can do it by themselves, that they can understand their role, they know how to use the technology in place, that they've been trained by us record, records managers on what we should and should not do. And we should not secede our power, our, our position within the company when it comes to security. That if IT is injecting itself in managing data, we really need to partner with them instead. We do not let them take control because the most probable outcome is that things will take longer, there will be more errors, and that once again, there will not be a records management in place, a program in place that helps govern how the data is accessed, who uses it, and how it's shared externally. We've referenced the information governance model on numerous occasions. And the reason we do that is at Canon, we use this as the foundation for building any program. You'll see in the inner core, the life cycle of records management, so the creation or ingestion, the management, and the ultimate disposition, whether that's archiving permanently, whether that is considered transactional data and can be destroyed, or an, if we keep it for so many years and then we eventually destroy it, whether it's electronic, or whether it's, it's physical. However, we need to now mature outside of that circle and start to address what's on the outer rim. And as you can see, privacy and security is considered a risk that we must address as records management. You can, if this is the area, if you've grown up in the records industry, if you've recently transitioned over to information governance, there may be a lack of knowledge when it comes to privacy and security. This may be seen as something that your IT group addresses, your security officer addresses, and it may not have anything to do with you. As I emphasized on the previous slide, that is not the case. And so you really want to refer back to this model at all times and say, I need to get educated in this area, I can't ignore it, and I can't abandon it to the IT professionals. An easy way to get involved is to seek a partner. And as, as referenced in this webinar today, you can see that Canon itself has done this by seeking a partnership with the Providence Group. And we hope that you find this webinar thought-provoking in areas in which you should be involved and why. And if you find yourself at a loss, uh, you need to find someone to mentor you, you need to find that vendor that will help you through this, similar to what Providence Group has done for us. So the infographic, we've all seen this. These are the world's biggest data breaches over the past 10 years. It's just a sampling of some of the incidents that have occurred. And what I wanted to draw your attention to more than what's on the left is really what's on the right why these incidents have occurred in the first place. So if you look at things that are simply, it's an inside job. So when we say inside job, it could be someone that non-maliciously shared something that was considered confidential, but they weren't trained that it was confidential. 
It could be simply leaving your smartphone or your laptop somewhere that someone can take it and they can hack into it and share the information that belongs to your company, stolen media, et cetera. Many of these occurrences that are represented here clearly fall within a records management program and should have been met, better met, monitored. And into, in addition to uh, the breaches that are identified in this excellent graphic, it should be also noted that this is not a complete representation of all of the cyber attacks uh, during this period of time. This graphic represents data from exposed uh, personal information, PII and PHI, personal health information, that are uh, made public as a requirement of breach notification laws. But in addition to uh, the breaches that you see on this graphic, what's not seen are the numerous um, attacks that are denial of service attacks, that shut down uh, business operations, but don't let information um, out, uh, ransomware attacks that hold information hostage until a ransom is paid, and the theft of intellectual property data that has uh, no regulation or requirement right now to be disclosed. So this graphic is used when discussing with our clients to explain where information governance has transitioned us as records management professionals from managing the tip of the iceberg, which was usually represented by what was contained in the records management software, what was on fiche, film, what's in off-site storage, and even sometimes what was in the document management system. However, our horizons have expanded rapidly and intensively over the past decade. And these buckets here, what's underneath the tip, is considered the dark data. We're missing a lot of major buckets here, but this is just a sampling to point out that the regulations that are addressed or concerned by all industries, that information that is collected by all firms or by all organizations are here within this sampling in which the records managers need to encompass in their world. So as we refer consistently back to the model that we showed earlier, we have to understand that we're dealing with data in various forms, various regulations, and that we need to be in touch with where our industry lies. So as we launch into the security aspect of this presentation, please don't think of it simply as the paper that you see or as the information that you may touch on a daily basis. Instead, as Jonathan just mentioned, you need to be responsible and accountable as part of what's considered PII, how do we behave when it comes to HIPAA, what happens when employees leave, are the access um, shut down, are passcodes changed, what are we doing with the customer information, can our customers trust us with their information? and employee information. Can our employees work in a safe environment that they want to work in your company because they understand that you're, you're a safe harbor? All right, one of the other tools that we mention frequently are the generally accepted record keeping principles. As you can see, this ties directly back to the model that we referred to earlier, and you'll see that principle of protection is one of the eight most important principles that we must keep in mind as we're dealing with and building a foundation. It's a good, if you access the maturity model, if you access the record principles, and if you read about them on ARMA's website, you'll, have, you'll see good information to gauge where your company is and where you should aspire. But in summary, here in the box we've provided you that it is your direct responsibility as a records manager or as an information governance professional to ensure that the information housed within your corporation is considered an asset. And regardless of where it is, whether it's being ingestion, ingested, whether it's being managed or externally sharing, you are being held accountable for that. You are also being held accountable to be able to speak to the regulations that govern your assets 
And as we explained extensively in our previous webinar series, you need to do data mapping. You need to refer back to what we call data, dark data, and know the areas of weaknesses so that you can approach your security officer, you can talk to your IT group, you can write the policies that mandate employee behavior because you understand how vendors and or subcontractors are accessing your data. You understand externally what the websites are, ha are housing, what your in internal websites and your portals are housing, how easy is it to cop and paste or forward or share, and smartphones. As the executive that says to the IT person, I need another app, I like this, I saw this out on the website, I wanna have it installed on my smartphone. You need to have that relationship with your security officer and your IT group that you know that this is occurring, but they also are mentored in what your concerns are so that it's not so quick to install on that executive's phone, or if they are, they're putting the parameters around it to safe keep the information. So when we're looking at that principle of protection, we need to view it as a risk. This is something that can't just be, okay, well, we know that we have to protect it. You have to consider it a cybersecurity risk. That's something that's on the top of your list to address. The asset that's listed here is obviously the data and the information, regardless if it's in transition or if it's at rest, just know that it's the most valuable asset for any company. Vulnerability is shown when there's a lack of records management program, which dictates, once again, the personnel behavior and the technology. We don't want to emphasize that technology is completely at fault or it's the savior to all of our problems. That's more based on policy and employee pay behavior and training, but we do acknowledge that if you have no partnership with IT, you can severely impact the protection of those assets. And the third area, the threat, Jonathan, which represents, who represents the Providence Group, is going to discuss the potential threats both internally and externally. So it looks like we're really spending a lot of time talking about IT, and I want to emphasize that IT is not at fault here. They are not to be blamed when there is hacking and security breaches. They could be, maybe they couldn't be. We just want to emphasize that in their roles, once again, it's a tactical concern where they're most focused on the infrastructure, the applications, firewalls, encryption, et cetera. There are more things that they're concerned with, but look at it from their viewpoint of what they have to accomplish on a daily basis and the urgency of making that information as accessible and timely as possible. However, you're stepping back and looking at it from a different angle. You're thinking of, Okay, the data is out there and it's in the confines of what IT is providing. What do I need now to do to understand where the risk falls? So you're going to do your individual testing access. You're also working with IT and the security officer in learning where the vulnerabilities lie. I've mentioned this quite frequently that you're training the employees on the behavior. If you have strict policies, and when I say strict, I mean remove words like could, would, should. You are telling them how to behave and what they should be doing and what's in existence and who's to access it. You are building levels of security and access in conjunction with IT to improve that security. And as you speak to IT and the security officer or security personnel, you're seeing it from their viewpoint of, okay, I have been requested to do this, I have a timeline, I have a project plan, I have to hit this milestone, but you're also understanding their vulnerabilities. And in return, you're mentoring them as to the importance of what they're doing and what they're building so that they also are considering the data that's confined within their, their applications and their infrastructure. And one way you can approach this this is a good presentation slide. This is a way to open the discussion. But you'll notice that here under the Chief Information Security Officer or whomever you have assigned to security in your company, they're concerned with confidentiality. 
that's their world. That's what they're building the policies on. That's what they're reporting into the executive board on. And then you're over on the other side working, understanding the integrity. Is it a record? Is it transactional material? Is it something that's vital? Is it permanent? Do I need to destroy it as soon as it comes into existence? So you're, one, you're also working in your silo. And then once again, IT is concentrating on availability. If you can combine those three aspects and open that discussion and explain your role and combine it with the confidentiality and availability, that's a very strong stepping stone into what Jonathan's going to be explaining and how we protect ourselves to the best ability we can against cybersecurity. So at this point, I'd like to hand over to Jonathan to discuss the five most important information questions and issues that we in this industry must address. Thank you, Melissa. Um, so the first question that comes up is how do you define risk? Um, there are four components of cybersecurity risk management. Framing the risk, which is what is the context in which my business is going to have risk from a cybersecurity perspective? How do I assess that risk? How do I respond to the risk? And how do I monitor that risk on an ongoing basis? I'm going to focus on the framing of the cyber risk because this is really at the executive and at the enterprise level, the first step within this four uh, stage process of cybersecurity risk management. So framing cybersecurity risk is about understanding what risk assumptions you're making. What are the assumptions you're making about the legal environment that you're in if a security breach happens? What's the regulatory environment? Who are the threat actors? What are my vulnerabilities both internally and externally? And what are the risks that I need to manage? In addition to that, it also is a conversation at the executive level to talk about what are my risk constraints? What budget trade-offs do I need to make in order to assure cybersecurity uh, risk mitigation? Um, what kinds of activities should I be involved in or should I choose not to be involved in because the risk is too great? Which leads to having an understanding that's communicated across the organization to what my risk tolerance is. So there's a difference between threat and vulnerability. Vulnerabilities typically are looked at at the IT level. What are my controls? What controls do I have? What controls do I need to shore up? Those are my technical vulnerabilities. But the threats can happen well outside of technical vulnerability. They can be insider threats, as Melissa mentioned. They can be threats from class action lawsuits. They can be threats by change in regulatory uh, and, and compliance rules and laws. These things need to be assessed and they need to be assessed up front and understood up front in order to be able to develop a risk management plan for cybersecurity. Moreover, it's important that how this information is communicated becomes extremely important into how successful any risk management plan is for cybersecurity. Too often we see that cybersecurity is discussed only in technical information technology terms. When, as we've already spoken about, there are a range of different kinds of risks that are associated with risk management in cybersecurity that are not technical. And so engaging business leaders in the language in which they speak to understand the risks so they can make business trade-offs is critical to having a successful risk management plan. So moving on to the next slide, the way in which we look at risk management for cybersecurity is that we have uh, adopted and extended a risk management model that was developed at Harvard Business School by professors Robert Kaplan and uh, Annette Meeks. They identified three different types of organizational risk and they put around it three different, what we did was we extended it to put around it, how do you put this into the context of cybersecurity and how do you operationalize it for an organization? So the three types of risk are preventable risk, which are risks that are identified and 
largely prevented through compliance and training activities, the rule-based. Strategy risk, which are new business decisions that will either choose to bring additional risk into an organization or choose to eliminate risk in an organization. And these are decisions that are made at the business level and need to be thought through from a cybersecurity perspective. And then finally, there's external risk. These are risks that must be thought about and imagined ahead of time and whose effects must be planned for and mitigated because they can't always be prevented. So if you look at the table on this next slide, what you'll see is the framing of those three types of risk, and then how is it that you approach the mitigation of that risk, and then how is that risk mitigation communicated? So in preventable risk, these are, this is the bread and butter, the blocking and tackling of cybersecurity, often discussed as cyber hygiene. They're rules-based, they're compliance-oriented, they're control-oriented, and they are rules that can be followed, and largely it's uh, assessed that about 80 to 85 percent of all cyber breaches can be avoided, can be prevented from this kind of activity if it's done correctly. So how is that risk communicated and, and monitored? It's monitored and communicated through internal audits, through security assessments, and through benchmarking. Strategy risk, on the other hand, are about future business decisions, decisions that need to be made that have a risk, cyber risk component. And they're communicated through the strategic planning process. A business decision is made for strategic reasons. Here are the risks involved. These are how these risks are gonna be mitigated. It includes business trade-offs. We're assuming risk for business purposes, but we're taking these other actions to mitigate that risk. External risk, on the other hand, has to do really with things that haven't happened to you yet, or presumably haven't happened to you yet, but are likely to be successful cyber attacks. And the way in which you approach these risks is to prepare for it, to mitigate the most uh, effects that are negative to the business, how you respond to it in order to increase your organization's resilience to that attack. The best way, yes. Sorry about that. You know, I, I do have a write-in question. I, if, uh, if we could just break for a moment for the, for sure. the write-in question. Um, is there a scorecard with benchmarks that is used to measure data security risk? If so, how can I get one? So I'm not aware of any a generally accepted scorecard in terms of scoring cyber risk. But what I can tell you is that the U.S. National Institutes of Standards and Technology have developed uh, for the past two years the cyber, their cybersecurity framework. Um, this is being looked at and updated, and it is becoming a generally accepted approach to cybersecurity risk management. Um, the document is not long. It's uh, very um, operationally oriented and helpful, and it can be found uh, right on the front page of the landing page at www dot NIST, N -I -S -T, dot gov. And their cybersecurity framework is, uh, is one of the links right on their front page. So finally on external risk, one of the best uh, methods that we've seen um, to imagine this and to prepare for what you would do in the event of a breach or an attack is scenario analysis. Um, scenario analysis was developed uh, in the 70s largely by uh, Royal Dutch Shell. It's been written about uh, in risk management um, for uh, the decades since. And it was recently just used uh, by the uh, University of California Center for Long-Term Cybersecurity uh, in their uh, cybersecurity, tw cybersecurity Futures 2020 document released last week. The benefit of this is that it's evidence-based. It looks at the range of different potential outcomes of risk that, could, uh, that you might have to deal with. And it allows you then not to know what the future is, it's not predictive, but it gives you the outlines of what you might have to deal with in order to make planning more effective and less expensive. So. 
once you have that, the question is, what is your role in cybersecurity risk management? Cybersecurity risk management is really a team sport. It is not simply the CIO or the chief information security officer, but it's the entire functional and executive team um, to really understand what the functions are that are affected by and that need to affect cybersecurity risk management and knowing where you fit in. Right now, there is no standard uh, governance for cybersecurity risk management, and uh, there are likely not many companies that look exactly the same in terms of how they deal with this risk. What is true, though, is that there are functions that are always involved. The two that I mentioned, the compliance or regulatory official, the general counsel, the chief financial officer, certainly the CEO, whoever's in charge of information governance, because that's an ass a business asset that needs to be protected. And roles and responsibilities and engagement at that executive team is essential for having an effective cybersecurity risk management plan. So why is that the case? The regulatory definition of reasonable security measures, which is largely a definition that is out in, in many of the regulated industries, goes well beyond IT. It, in, it enables uh, personnel and training issues, data collection and use, which is a business decision, vendor oversight in terms of the supply chain, and board engagement. So let's just look at a couple of examples um, in terms of this that sort of illustrate the point. So in uh, September of last year, the Securities and Exchange Commission um, brought a case against a um, company called R.T. Jones Capital Equity Management. This is a fund manager, investment manager, and Basically, what had happened was R.T. Jones um, had a breach. PII of their clients were exposed. Uh, the SEC was the regulatory authority over R.T. Jones, and uh, they settled with uh, this order being promulgated last September. Two important points on this case. The first is that the breach did not come out of R.T. Jones's servers under their control. It was a third-party hosted web server that got breached. But because that information was owned by RT Jones and it was their customers, they were held responsible. So that's where vendor management comes in. So who, your procurement officer who is, and the general counsel who are crafting the contracts for their vendors need to be engaged to make sure that risk is managed on those relationships that ultimately come back to your organization. The second thing is that one of the failures that R.T. Jones had was actually not poor cybersecurity necessarily. In fact, they had limited the amount of access to their customer data to only two administrators who were well-trained and qualified. The problem was, and what the SEC found, is that R.T. Jones had failed to adopt written policies and procedures that reasonably designed that were reasonably designed to safeguard consumer information or their customer information. So really, at the end of the day, it was about written policies and procedures. Written policies and procedures generally are not coming out of uh, the CIO shop. Or if they are, they're certainly engaged with HR, general counsel, and other executive team members. So the other thing is that in terms of managing this enterprise risk, cybersecurity risks change very, very rapidly. And particularly now we're in a rapid change uh, environment for a number of different cybersecurity threat aspects. The first is the threat actors and how they attack. And the second is the regulatory environment that, they, that we are all operating in. The third area of rapid change is in the legal environment, class action lawsuits, liability issues, um, and other kinds of legal aspects that can have significant business impacts. 
as we look at the next issue, what is the threat to you? So we've mentioned a number of them, and we'll take the opportunity now to sketch out some of the specifics. So in terms of legal, what we have seen is a significant change in the last 18 to 20 months with regard to the success of class action lawsuits against companies who have had cyber, successful cyber breaches. Prior to about two years ago, most, if not all, of these lawsuits were dismissed on the grounds that the plaintiffs did not have standing, largely because harm could not be, could not be determined. Uh, it was theoretical harm uh, what was accepted. It might be identity theft, there might be harm, but we can't prove it, so therefore there was not standing. This has changed significantly. In fact, um, there have been a number of cases to include Sony Pictures Entertainment, Target, Neiman Marcus, Home Depot, St. Joseph Hospital System, all of these uh, attempts at class action have, in fact, stood the test, have been moved forward at the, either at the state level or at the district uh, federal court level or at the appellate level. And within days, if not in one case, even before, all of these cases were settled. This represents a financial risk to organizations in the tens of millions of dollars. Additionally, there are lots of threats from external sources and internal sources. So one thing that people have probably heard about are the threats to companies and especially the theft of intellectual property data from nation states. Just last week, the United States Steel Corporation accused the uh, Chinese government of hacking into their servers to steal plans for developing new steel technology um, for automotive uh, vehicles to give Chinese companies a leg up. And they brought a complaint and they filed it last week with the International Trade Commission. This is similar to the indictment of the five members of the Chinese uh, PLA army who uh, were hacking and stealing from US corporations. But that's just one aspect. What are some of the other aspects of the external threats for business purposes that your organizations might, might face? Another example, actually much closer to home, was a linen services company in New Hampshire. They recently pled guilty to hacking into the computer server of a similarly named but smaller competitor that was just some miles away. What's interesting about this case is that the server that they hacked into was actually, again, a third party vendor. And this vendor was a system uh, that did their financial system. So the women's services company in New Hampshire stole invoices of this other company, over a thousand invoices of this other company. They did it in order to get the names of their customers so they could go and steal their customer base. So that's just yet another type of cyber crime that happens that those risks have to be imagined and mitigated. From an inside perspective, an interesting case that surprises lots of people, it certainly did at the time, was the case of the insider breach and attack for the St. Louis Cardinals baseball team. In this case, a scouting director who had left the Cardinals and went to a competing team, the Houston Astros, went with knowledge um, of his colleagues' passwords into their scouting database. After he arrived at his new uh, employer's location, he used the knowledge of those passwords, so that was a breakdown in password protection protocol. He used those passwords that he knew to break into the servers and to the database for scouting of the Cardinals to steal their data to use it for their benefit. Basically, it just goes to, understand, to broaden the concept of what is that threat to you. 
It could be from vendors. It could be from insiders. It could be former employees. It could be current employees. It could be competitors. But then there's also another thing to think about. It has to do with the difference between targeted and random attacks. The things that I just mentioned are targeted attacks. They were purposefully done, purposefully targeted. And you might ask, well, maybe I'm not going to be targeted. But the issue of random attacks is significant. Just because something is random, which really means not targeted, doesn't mean that it's not likely to happen. And you may have seen in the last couple of months many instances of what's called ransomware attacking hospitals throughout North America and particularly in the United States. This malware is uh, sent to people through emails that people will click on. It will download software onto their machine, which encrypts all of the data on their machine. And a message comes up that says, if you provide us this ransom amount in Bitcoin, we will give you the encryption key so you can unlock your data. Basically rendering both the computer inoperable and all of your business asset information unavailable. These attacks are not targeted to specific organizations. And in fact, ransomware has been growing as a problem over the last year, year and a half. We just heard about it in terms of recently with hospitals, but it can happen to anyone. It's happened to local police departments who've had to pay ransom. It's happened to small companies uh, throughout the United States. So in order to understand what the threat is, it helps to think about it broadly, evidence-based, and to have a partner where you get threat information. On the technical level, it could be from an information sharing organization, an ISAC, an ISO. At the strategic level, there are a number of different vendors that have um, strategic intelligence about these kinds of threats that can help you prepare and mitigate against them. Well, thank you, Jonathan. We appreciate that. And we have reached our poll question. We very much would like to hear from our audience. And the question we have for you is, what do you think are your organization's top risks? Are they regulatory, inside threat, outside hacking? Would you say all of the above, or would you say other? We'll just take a second or two here and, and begin to gather some of your responses. We do have a big group here today. Um, but I do want to mention to my panelists, we are running a bit long, so um, I think that uh, we'll just spend a second or two more here. Uh, let's see. We'll give a second or two more. The greatest response right now at this point is all of the above. Jonathan, are we surprised by that? You know, I'm not surprised by that um, because it's unclear how to differentiate these threats. They are all around, and at the end of the day, the ones that are more likely or not more likely to your organization is specific to your organization, which, why, which is why we suggest that all organizations actually go through the risk management process of determining what their risk actually is and how to mitigate it. It could be all of the above. It could be two out of the three or more likely. So is compliance enough? So the simple answer to that question is no. And as we were talking just previously about ransomware and hospitals, that is a perfect example of why a compliance program is not sufficient. So HIPAA privacy and security rules have absolutely no bearing and no impact and had no play in the ransomware attacks against these hospitals. The reason why is because no personal health information was exposed as a result of it. What did happen was hospital operations were effectively shut down. In the case of Hull Presbyterian in California, they were shut down for about 10 days. In the MedStar in the Baltimore, Washington area, there were services that were shut down for up to a week. So these were huge business interruptions. They had incredible reputational risk and reputational harm to these organizations. Uh, there was significant business disruption and loss, but it was not a compliance violation. It was not a regulatory issue. And having 
done everything they can in terms of the compliance checklist, they still left themselves open for this type of attack. So compliance should be looked at as a, a floor, not a ceiling. It's necessary, but it's not sufficient. The only way you know this, and the only way that you can begin to identify the risks that you can mitigate and that need to be mitigated is by doing that gap analysis. What are the things we're doing in our compliance program? And then what are the threats that are left over that we still need to mitigate? And then finally, um, oh, I'm sorry. So regulators are looking at this and regulators are looking beyond mere compliance checklists. So as I had mentioned in the earlier question, the National Institutes of Standard and Technology, their cybersecurity framework is becoming a de facto standard across all of the regulatory independent and, uh, and executive branch regulatory agencies in the United States. So it's absolutely something to take a look at. And then also the Federal Trade Commission really has emerged as a result of a number of different legal disputes, as well as they've been doing this for you know, the past 15 years they are, uh, for consumer information, the lead regulator for cybersecurity. Their expectations are not compliance oriented. They're planning oriented, they're response oriented. It's what they are looking to is, are you doing the risk assessment? Are you coming up with a plan? Do you have training and education? But they're not specifying how you do it, but it is an expectation that you do do it. And then finally, on our last slide for this section, what are the barriers to a good cybersecurity risk management plan? Fundamentally, there are three barriers. The first is communicating effectively that it's a team organizational sport, that IT has to talk to HR, has to talk to compliance, has to talk to information governance, has to talk to the CEO, has to talk to the CFO, and all have to talk to the board. It's important to have governance in place so people know what their roles and responsibilities are. And most importantly, it's important finally to engage in developing a culture of cybersecurity so that cybersecurity becomes ways to mitigate the risk and deal with issues once they uh, come up in a seamless way that reduces business cost and reduces business loss. So what we recommend organizations to do are to conduct a cybersecurity enterprise risk assessment. It's not particularly tedious. It doesn't have to be particularly expensive but it is important to identify what those risks are today and in the future. From that, to develop a cybersecurity risk management plan, how are you going to get to the end state or how are you gonna to get to the risk mitigation state that you want and over what period of time? It certainly doesn't have to be in a month, in a day. It can be over the course of a year, over the course of three years. Establish a good cybersecurity training program the benefits of this are that it helps your employees and it helps everybody in their personal lives as well as in their business lives. Everybody gets spam, whether it's on their personal email, everybody has problems in terms of uh, websites that are infected. So good cybersecurity training is a twofer. It helps your employees in their personal lives and it helps the business. And then finally, recognize that it's likely that at some point you're gonna be hacked and have a response plan ready so that you minimize at most any disruption that takes place in the business. One of the areas in which information governance professionals who are just launching into this area and doing the research is we say protect your data wherever it goes. And one of the areas that you can research independently is what's called data loss prevention. And really, there are five areas in which you want to research your data in-house. So that's data in motion, the network traffic, data in use, which is basically your workstations, your service, your servers, aka your active data. You'll want to identify your data. So is it confidential? Is it sensitive? Is it something that's okay to share firm-wide and externally? 
potentially data leakage, especially with, as Jonathan mentioned quite a few times, with third-party vendors, subcontractors, departing, uh, departing employees. And then data at rest. This is your archived information, which tends to be abandoned or ignored. It's not migrated properly. It's left in repositories because no one knows what to do with it. So you want to pay attention to that. So I'm going to repeat that. So it's data in motion, in use, identify the data, data leakage potential, and then data at rest, which is your archiving. And as a wrap up, for those that have attended my previous webinars, Jonathan mentioned a gap analysis. So as information governance, Professionals, don't forget the framework that we've been discussing and training on over this past year in that we also recommended what he calls a gap analysis, but what we call a business process assessment. Basically the same thing where you're identifying your corporate goals, you're understanding where the information is, what document types are in use, all the regular regulatory requirements that impact your company. You conduct this investigation, you put together the report, and then as you see phase two through five, you're going to submit that report, you're going to get approval for all the recommendations you've made, whether it's training for yourself, whether it's interacting more with all the ver various people in your company that are impacted uh, by the regulations. You plan for change, you come up with an implementation tool, and then, most importantly, the analytics part of it. You have to audit the compliance of whatever you've built. So all the good advice that Jonathan just gave us on next steps, it's great to build it, it's exciting, it's interesting, but then six months later, are you keeping abreast of where cyber risk may exist? Are you still in touch with the people that you initially engaged? And are you auditing the employee's behavior that what you've trained them to do, all the documentation and the policies that you've rolled out, who's monitoring that compliance? So it's very important that you also provide the analytics as a closed loop reporting. Well, that concludes today's presentation. I wanna thank our audience for joining us and thank our presenters today. We hope you found today's insights helpful. A sound information governance program and information security go hand in hand. If you have any additional questions for Jonathan on data security or Melissa on information governance, please see their emails right here on the screen. We'd be happy to follow up with you to discuss how we can help. Also, before you leave us, um, there are some exit questions uh, as, you, as you exit the WebEx today. We would very much appreciate your feedback about today's program. We use that as we develop future programs. And thank you again, everyone. Thank you, our presenters, and have a wonderful afternoon.